I'm working. <laughs> we rehearsed this. Well, there you go. Take the mic the antenna. I just know it's behind him. I don't know. All right. Now, now can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, yeah. All right. I got a big voice. I probably don't even need this thing. All right. My name is Jason Holmes. I grew up in Bloomington, Indiana. I like to tell everybody I kind of moved into Evansville through marriage. My wife, Stephanie, uh, is a native. She's one of those West Siders. Her and Mike graduated from uh, uh, Wright's High School. You won't believe it, but it wasn't at the same year. Okay. Uh, yes, yes, there you go. But anyway, I've, we've lived here about seven and a half, eight years and enjoyed every bit of it. And then I've been lucky enough to be able to volunteer out here. Uh, today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about uh, the Battle of Midway. First of all, let me see hands. How many veterans do I have? Oh, that's the next one. All right, well, thank you all for your service. Do I have any Navy veterans? Oh, even better. All right, the reason I chose this topic was because here at the museum, we do a lot of displays for ground troops and things like that, and of course, obviously, aviation. But we don't do a lot here for the, for the, the, the Navy people. Like I, I realize we're in the middle of the country, but that's one of the reasons I chose this topic, okay? And so, uh, I have two uncles that were Navy veterans in World War II. Uh, my father and her father were uh, Korean War veterans. So that flag means an awful lot to our family, and I, 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 you know, I, I cherish that flag, to be honest with you. Okay. So what I want to talk about here is a little background. The first thing I want to mention is the players. You know, I, I was around athletics all my life, and you've got to have a program if you're going to know the, you got to know the players in the program. And the first one, which he referred to, Dr. Cooper referred to, the Sego Browning was uh, Admiral Yamamoto. If your grandkids were here, they say that's the man. Okay, Dr. Yamamoto is the one who was the person or the architect behind both the Pearl Harbor attack and the Battle of Midway. He was responsible for both. He was educated at Harvard. He, uh, of course, was very fluent in English. He lived in the United States for a number of years as military attaché. To, uh, to Washington from Japan. He was known as a gambler, and I don't mean penny any poker. I mean, you did not play cards with that man. Ever. He was well known. In his diary, he wrote, if he had not been called to service by the emperor, he would have sold all his possessions and moved to Monte Carlo and been a professional gambler. Now, that kind of gives you about his personality. One of his favorite things would do would be to, uh, when young, young, you know, basically, the lieutenants or things that come under his command, he would, he would at first the question he'd ask us is, are you lucky? Because he wanted people around him that were lucky. And he would always make them play cards with him and he would always get them well indebted to him. But one of his favorite things to do when it comes time to pay, he would always forgive the debts. Well, this made a lot of goodwill with all the junior officers, trust me, okay? So he was a, he was, he, he was a very formidable adversary. And a very, you know, at, at the time of the start of the war, he was the best military mind that the, the Japanese had. The next character is this is Admiral Nagumo. Nagumo was the one who was in charge of the carriers at both Midway and at Pearl Harbor. He is, his expertise was not carrier tactics. He is actually his expertise is uh, is torpedoes. But through just seniority and seniority alone, he was given this command. He was not well liked by Yamamoto at all. It would not have been his choice. But he, it was one of those fights Yamamoto just kind of went along with. He did not like him. He thought he was rigid. He didn't think he was flexible in his thinking. He didn't think he, he relied too much on his subordinates. And he was uh, prone to not take enough risk and for Yamamoto. So if he would have had his way, that wouldn't have been the person in charge of the carriers. But luckily for us, us being the United States, he was in charge. You'll find out here in a few minutes why I say that. The next person, this is Chester Nimitz. He probably received the most famous order ever given by the commander in chief. After the debacle, I guess you would call it, at Midway, Roosevelt called him up and he says, you get your ass out to, Midway, or to Pearl Harbor and don't come home until you've won the war. And, that, and, and that's exactly what he did. Okay, and so Nimitz is, uh, he, he, he's kind of a combination here, but all I say what most attracts me to him is that his demeanor, he's very calm, he's very precise, but he is a risk taker, but it's a calculated risk. He will listen to supported officers. He was the vaccinated, in my opinion, the perfect person to be put in charge of the, 
of the South Pacific Fleet after, after <coughs> Pearl Harbor. And he was on board the Missouri when they signed the end of the war. So he did exactly as he was told by the president. He won the war and stayed till it was over. This is one you probably do not know. This is Edwin Layton. He was, uh, he was really, he was beside uh, uh, Nemesis' side throughout the whole war. He was his intelligence officer, very bright. He lived in Japan for a while, spoke fluent Japanese. And he knew the Japanese and he knew their culture. Just as Yamamoto knew America and American culture, he was the same. Nemes relied on him heavily and he wrote a book in 1986, which I recommend to all of you, it says, I was there. In which he tells about all the decisions that were made leading up through the whole war in the South Pacific. It's a very good book. And we'll talk a little more about him also. This is our superstar. Okay, I'm very curious here. This is Captain Joseph Rocheford. Raise your hand if you've ever heard that name before. Two of you. All right, now everybody in here has heard of, oh, you've heard of George Patton. You've heard of Audie Murphy. He is on the same level as those. In my opinion, and this is my opinion, someone who has studied this the war for 50 years, he is the most unsung hero the United States has ever produced. And a lot of it, most of it, is all political. Without him, there would have been no Battle of Midway, or at least the outcome would not have been what it was. He, he is, I can't give him enough accolades, and you're going to find out why I say that here in just a few minutes. And it's, I hope that after today, everyone in here will know the name Joseph Rochefort. He was the most, well, the Navy just did, did, not, did not do him right until well after his death. Okay. Uh, go ahead. This is Midway. Now, I would probably say most of you in here thought Midway was one island. It's not. It's two. The one closest to you is East, or East, East Island, and the one on the back is Sand Island. It's called Midway because in the 30s, the Pan Am Clippers would leave out of the United States, heading to the Orient, halfway there, Midway. They would land, refuel, change pilots, let the people off the plane, feed them, and then continue on their way. So the name Midway comes because it's just about halfway between Japan and the United States. And it is a two island complex and it had both, on, and during the war it had uh, supplies and uh, ordinances on both islands. So we used both those little islands. Yeah. Now, before we get started, I've got to lead up here a little history so that when I start talking about it, you got a little background. The first thing is, of course, the attack on Pearl Harbor. Everybody knows December 7th, 1941. That's not new to anybody. I'm almost sure that if I ask everybody in here, do you think that was a resounding success for the Japanese? I'm, I'm going to say most of you would agree it was. Well, it was and it wasn't, okay? Yamamoto's, what he would, all right, I'm going to start right, stop right here. There is no way, listen to me, there is no way Japan could have ever won the war against the United States. It could have never happened. I don't care what happened in Pearl Harbor, I don't care what happened in Midway or anything else. That little island nation was not going to invade the United States, work all the way across the United States and take this country. It wasn't ever going to happen. His whole plan was, Yamamoto's whole thing to get done was to put enough damage on the American carrier force so that we would have to negotiate a, a, a settlement or a peace. In other words, leave him alone, he'll go leave us alone. Now that was, that was what he was trying to achieve. It wasn't to conquer the United States. And so at Pearl Harbor, the first thing, the first thing he wanted done was when the attack was to destroy the American carriers. We were very, very fortunate, and this is pure luck. Nimitz had sent the carriers to Midway to deliver airplanes. And then on the way back, they stayed offshore and, and did, you know, they were practicing dive bombing and landings and takeoffs. And they weren't in Pearl Harbor during the attack. This was a very, this very much upset Yamamoto, trust me. The second one, which he was very successful at, and that was to attack the American fleet with its battleships. There was eight battleships, two of them were totally destroyed, six of them were very much damaged. Of course, they also took out over 200 planes that were on the ground. They attacked Wheeler, Hickam, and the Ford Island Air, For uh, Air Bases and did major damage to all those, plus other surface attacks. A guy named Fushida, a Lieutenant Fushida, led the attack at Pearl Harbor. He was the best, probably the best fighter leader that the Japanese had at that time. 
He's picking, he took in the first attack, and there's a, you know, I, I, some of you probably heard this, the Torah, 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 they made a movie named that, all right? That was the code that was to be sent out if the Japanese had totally surprised the Americans at Pearl Harbor. And it was supposed to go to Nagumo, back on the carriers. But through the atmospherics or something, it bounced all the way to Japan. And the Japanese high command heard the call, the call, Torah, Torah, Torah. Fushida is the one that made that call. And so he stayed over after the first wave was left. The second wave came in about 55 minutes later. He stayed over Pearl until it and directed that battle until it started. And then he went back to the carriers. When he landed, he thought that the carriers would be full of action, rearming, refueling all that first wave that had come back. But there was nothing going on. And he jumped out of his plane and he was met by a man named Ginda, who was second in command of the carriers, and told that Nagumo had decided that two, two attacks was enough, that they had a, a success that he was breaking for home. This infuriated Fushida. And Fushida, at the end of the war, actually wrote a book to and he just, I mean, he lambased Nagumo over this decision. But the third thing, and the reason there was supposed to be a third attack, and we're very thankful this didn't happen, was that they were supposed to take out the repair facilities and also the oil reserves. Now you think about it, had they taken out these oil reserves, we would have had to take our fleet all the way back to San Diego to refuel. So there had been no way we could have taken the war to the Japanese, at least in the first six months to maybe a year. So it was a huge, huge mistake by Nagumo not to attack that on that third wave. That's the reason I said a little while ago, we were thankful in the United States that Nagumo was over that carrier force. Okay. A couple other things that happened that I can lead up to. As soon as this battle was over, Yamamoto started preparing for the Battle of Midway. Because the main reason was because those carriers weren't destroyed. Now he knew that was the secret. That is the key. Was those key. We could not take the war to the Japanese without the carriers. We'd send our surface fleet out into those little islands like the Solomons and the Marshalls and all that. They would have had Air Force uh, bases on there. They could have attacked our surface vehicles and there was nothing we could do about it. So he knew they had to be taken out. So he started planning the Battle of Midway almost immediately after he found out that the carriers weren't destroyed. It did not get a, well, a, a war reception by the high command. It, was, it is absolutely the most intricate battle plan you've ever seen, next to probably only D-Day. And I've studied both of them a lot. There's a place on the internet you can go to, there's an eight hour video of just the Battle of Midway. Now I promise I'm gonna have you in, out of here under seven. So, <laughs> just gotta, uh, so it's a very, very intricate battle. And that was what the high command was afraid of. They said, you know, this thing's got too many, it's like an octopus, it's got too many things going on. And so they were afraid of it. Well then on April 18th, 1942, Doolittle, at that time, Colonel Doolittle took 15 Mitchell bombers off the deck of the Hornet and he attacked Tokyo. And now that, you know, the attack did very little, but it was a propaganda thing. And when Roosevelt was asked where, the, where those planes come from, he said, our secret bases in Shangri-La. Well, the Japanese knew exactly where those planes had come from. They had to come from an aircraft carrier. So all of a sudden, boy, this plan that had been kind of put on the back lane, it was known as Operation MI, that was the code name for it, it was put on the back burner, it, it, it came to the front. They said, well, we can't have this. We put the emperor at, da at, at danger. And so his, it moved forward very rapidly. One other thing happened, that on May 3rd in the Coral Sea, now, Rochefort, my star, okay, he intercepted and messages or, inter or intercepted communications that the Japanese were sending a task force to New Guinea. We were hanging on by our fingernails at New Guinea. Now we had to keep that island because if we didn't, it would disrupt our supply lines between the United States and Australia and the communication lines. So we were just hanging on. So when that came through that they were sending a task force down there to reinforce New Guinea, Nimitz sent Fletcher in Task Force 17, which was consisted of the Yorktown and the Lexington, the carrier group, to the Coral Sea to intercept them, which he did. It's the first naval battle ever fought in history where no surface ships made sight of each other. It was strictly airplanes. And you know, the, a lot of historians will call it an even draw. I, I'm not in that camp. Uh, I, I kind of give the edge to the Americans. Uh, the Americans lost the carrier Lexington. It was sunk, or actually it blew up. 
The Yorktown was hit by two 500-pound bombs, sustaining major damage especially to its aft elevator. The Japanese lost a light carrier, but they had both their main carriers with that task force sustain heavy damage. So because of that, the Japanese turned around and they went home. In other words, we did what we were supposed to do. We kept them from invading New Guinea. So I think I give the advantage to us, although we paid a terrible price. All right, so now that's the lead up. Our, our man Rocheford comes to the lake and he says, I'm telling you there's something big in the works. If you, Rocheford is the person, now you, you hear him say, well, he's a genius. You, we, we throw out, he's a genius. Rocheford was a genius, okay? He had a photographic memory. He was the most, one of the most extraordinary people I've ever studied in my life. But he was like a lot of people who are ultra smart, he was different. And that's the reason you don't know about him, because he was shunned by the high command. He was not a spit and polished officer at all. He started, he, didn't go to, he did not go to Annapolis, he worked his way up through the ranks. He, ended, he enlisted when he was 17 years old, worked his way up. He, he was in charge of Station Hypo, which is a listening and communication station on the island of Oahu. And they would intercept and, and basically break down Japanese code. They broke the Japanese code, it was JN-25. That was the Japanese naval code. He and his group broke this code and they could read maybe about 25% of the communications coming in, but that was enough for Rocheford. And he, he went to Leighton and he says, the amount of traffic that, is being, that we're intercepting, he says it's, it's just quadrupled here in the last few weeks. He said something big is getting ready to happen. So Leighton actually says, well, what is it? At first he was a little hesitant to say, and he says, look, I can't take this to Nimitz. If you don't tell me what, what's going on, he says, well, I'll tell you. He says, they're gonna attack they're going to attack Midway. He says, why do you say that? And he said, three months ago, I saw, just came across his deck, uh, desk, I saw a piece of paper that said an airplane was passing AF. And this is three months. He's probably read 10,000 communications between them. And he says, well, why do you think AF's that? And he says, because we went back and we looked, and the only landmass that could possibly be there that this plane could be passing is Midway. Well, Leighton said, you know, this is pretty thin, Joe. He says, you want me to take this up the ladder? He says, you have to take it up the ladder. Well, he went to Nimitz. <clears throat> Nimitz said the same thing. You want me to risk the, all the remaining carriers and our surface fleet on a three-month-old cable that, you know, that has really no, we can't substantiate. And so Nimitz went down to see Rocheford. And this, this I'd love to see this meeting. Rocheford rarely came out of this bunker complex where they were stationed. It was Station Hypo. It was an underground old bunker where him and his men worked. He would stay in there. He wore an old robe, a bathrobe, had a crinkled up shirt. He would go for days and not shave. He wore house slippers. Now this is a naval officer, so you can imagine the impression he would make on other naval officers. Well, when Nimbus came in and saw this, I, he was a little taken back. But Leighton said, listen, I am telling you, this guy is a genius, and if he tells you they're attacking, that's what they're gonna do. And so Nemes listens, and I told you that was one of his things, he would listen. And, and I think he was convinced, but he says, look, Washington will barbecue. He says, I gotta have more than you saying three months in the back that AF was midway. So on, on May 29th, no, I, yeah, on May 29th, no, that's not true. On May 19th, sorry, I got my days wrong. On May 19th, Rocheford sent a coded message to Midway. And he says, tomorrow morning on May 20th, I want you to send out clear channel that your water distillery system is broken down. So the next morning, Midway sends it out, just as it was supposed to, you know, the water condition, the condenser is broken down. Within an hour or so, they pick up, the, one of the listening stations picks up that AF has, has a water problem. Well, they knew right then, boy, that, that sealed the deal. They knew that AF was, as he said, was, was midway. Washington had been trying to convince uh, that the AF was some place down in the South Pacific, probably down around the Coral Sea, or maybe even Australia itself. But Roseford had dispelled this, and now this was proof. So things really got going now. I mean, they kicked into high gear. And so what they did, he went and Nimitz said, look, you have got to, you've got to decipher all this and tell me their battle plan. I've got to know what they're going to do. 
So Rocheford and his crew for the next four days, 24 hours, I don't think he slept for four days. He started taking all the communicates together and putting them together. And he, again, I'm telling you, he was the only person in the United States that could have done this. And within four days, he worked out the total battle plan. He knew the ships, he knew the direction, he knew the hours, he knew who the commanders were. And he reported that to Leighton, he reported it to Nimitz. And that was in four days. Go to the next slide. <clears throat> These are the Japanese carriers. It was called the Kido Butai. That's the Japanese term for the carriers. There are four of them. The Akagi, which was the flagship in the Gumo. It was the biggest and the most, most armed. The Soru and the Kaga, or I mean the Hiru, excuse me, were the two least armed, but they were the two newest of the carriers, and they were the fastest. And the other, the fourth one was the Hiru, the Kaga, the Soru, and the Akagi. Those are the four, all right? And that made up the Kido Butai, as it was called. These were the carriers that were going to be at the Battle of Midway. <coughs> He laid this all out for Nimitz. He said, these forers will be there. They'll be under the command of Admiral uh, Nagumo. And it's a four-pronged attack. Go to the white slide for me, if you would. I'll come back to that one. Go to the white slide. One more. All right. What the plan was, and this is a four-pronged attack. The first one that's not on here, they were going to send a force out of here up to the Aleutian Islands. It's going to attack uh, Dutch Harbor. The only thing at Dutch Harbor is some weather stations. It was strictly as a diversionary attack. Everything that Yamamoto planned here was under the idea that the carriers were still at Honolulu. They had to be. They had to be at Pearl. And there was no reason they think they weren't. Okay? So his whole thing was that the planning was that those carriers were there. His next thing he said that he was going to do after he put the, he, he brought the Nagumo in, this is Midway, he brought him in on a northwesterly track right here, or northeasterly track, excuse me, track right here. So the four carriers, when they begin the battle, would be in about that position where my light is. Yamamoto, in the main attack, which he would have been on the big battleships, he would have been on the Yamato, which the Yamato was the biggest warship ever built, and up until 1966, I think it was. <laughs> It was a huge battleship, and he and the rest of the battleships would be 600 miles behind the main strike force, which was the Gumos. Down here was Admiral Kondo's force, which was an invasion force, and it would consist of about 5,000 troops. So the way this battle was supposed to play out, the diversionary attack would start on July, uh, J uh, excuse me, June 3rd. On the June 4th, Nagumo would attack by air midway and, and knock it out of action. The following day, Kondo's force would take the island with 5,000 troops. And then the thought was that the Americans would rush the, the carriers from out of, coming out of Honolulu up here to intercept or to take on people that had attacked or had taken over midway. That's when Yamamoto would engage them in a surface battle. And the Yamato, the, 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 the ship that the Yamato was on, it had 18-inch barreled guns. It could shoot a shell the size of a Volkswagen 20 miles. Okay, that's how big this ship was. And the idea was that they would wipe out the American fleet there midway, and then the Americans would have to uh, pursue a course of, of, of negotiation. Now, that, that, that's what was supposed to happen. But it all was predicated on the couriers being there and, of course, it being a sneak attack. Well, it was a sneak attack, and we were going to do the sneak. All right, so going back to, to late, or I mean to uh, Rocheford. Rocheford intercepted a communique that said that the Japanese were going to send a float plane over Pearl Harbor to make sure those carriers were there. He passed that along up, so Nimitz sent a, out here to French frigate Shoals. The float plane was going to come out of Kwajalein, I believe, and it was going to land here and refuel from a submarine that fly over Pearl Harbor and radio back to and tell them that the carriers were there. Well, we sent a destroyer down here to just patrol. That meant that submarine couldn't, couldn't come up and refuel that plane, so that part of the operation had to be canceled. Did that worry Yamamoto? I don't think so. 
but he wasn't happy about it, but he just wrote it off as bad luck. All right. The next thing Yamamoto decided to do was put a line right here from about like this, a picket line of submarines that would look for any surface vehicles heading towards uh, Midway. Again, this is one of these minor miracles. What they did was that they started coming on station here, but right up here was the last one to come in on station, and that just happened to be where the Americans slipped through, just before they got there. Well, probably within hours of each other. So what happened on the American side was that Fletcher limped home the, the Yorktown from the Coral Sea. It came in on late on the 26th, early 27th. Uh, Nimitz was waiting on it. They had the docks lined with every, every conceivable tool, anything they would need to fix that carrier, and, a, and an unlimited manpower. As soon as it docked, they rushed that ship and started working on it. Nimitz went aboard and he told the chief engineers on there, you have three days. The engineers had radio and said they would need three weeks in a dry dock in, in Seattle to fix that, that boat or that ship. He says, you got three days. That ship sails in three days, and it better be ready to go. So they start working on it. That afternoon on the 27th, he called a meeting in his office at the war room. He brought in all the top people, all the top brass, and in that meeting was a, a rear admiral named Raymond Spruance. All right. Spruance had been given command of Task Force 16, which consisted of the carriers, the uh, Enterprise, and the Hornet. The guy that was over this was uh, Bull Halsey. But Halsey had come down with shingles and had to be put in the hospital. Now, Spruance was a very strange pick, really, but it, it turned out to be an ingenious. And it, it, again, it goes back to, to Nimitz's building. There was a lot of other officers that were senior to him, and he was a cruiser commander. He wasn't a, a carrier commander, but he knew it. He knew his personality. He says he's intelligent, he's calculating, He's, he's, he's prone to risk, but not, he won't take unnecessary risk. He thought he was the person for the job, and, and he was, okay? So in this meeting, you have Spruance, and you have Fletcher, you have you know, the rest of the brass, and they lay out the plan, just as I did a little bit ago for you, who was gonna attack where and when. And so he told uh, Spruance, he said, you sail tomorrow morning on the 28th. And so on the 28th, Task Force 16, which is the carriers, the Year Prize, and the Hornet, and the surface ships left, and they went up here to an area right up here, a little northeast of Midway. He told Fletcher, he says, 48 hours later, you're sailing. And so early on the morning of the 30th, they left. And that's Task Force 17. And that's where the luck came in. Because Tax Force 17, by a matter of just a few hours, slipped through that, that curtain, if you will, of, of submarines that were there to detect any ship movement. And on early on the, on the 3rd, June 3rd, they met up right up here at a place they, they codenamed Point Luck. And they worked independent of each other. In other words, Spruance was over his command, Fletcher was over his command, but Fletcher had overall control. So now we're, we're at the third. They knew the plan was solid. They knew, uh, they knew that uh, Rochefort was correct because on the third up here at Dutch Harbor, they had the, they started the battle, which they were totally ignoring. Go back to the blue slide for me. Okay. I'll, I'll put this one up here. It's a little bit easier to get all this up. There. So this is what it looked like. There's Dutch Harbor. Here's where they met, right here, Task Force 16 and 17. Here's Kondo's force coming in, here's Yamamoto's force, and here's the Gumos. So it's, got, it's, 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 it's on, all right, the, it's on right now. So the early, early on the morning of the 4th, out of Midway, PBYs were sent out of here, 16 of them, to look for the Japanese fleet. Number seven, it was codenamed Strawberry Seven, number seven at a just about 0415. Just after the sun had come up, it spots Nagumo's force. But you gotta realize the sun had just come up, it was hazy, visibility was a little poor, and the Japanese always kept zeros above the carriers when it was daylight. The carriers, the zeros saw this PBY and started towards it. 
The PBY was at the end of its run, it was low on fuel, but he radioed back. Now this is important. He radioed back two carriers spotted, two. This gave a lot, you know, Fletcher's going, wait a minute here, whoa, whoa, there's supposed to be four. Where are the other two? The other two were there, but he just couldn't see them through the haze. Well, what happened was those, those zeros chased that PBY back up into the clouds before he could spot the other two, and he had to start home because of fuel. So we knew there was at least two there, all right? So now at 0430, Nagumo turns the carriers into the wind and he's going to launch 108 planes to attack Midway. Well, you say 108, there's supposed to be more than that. Go back to that slide with the Keto Butai. This is what we had. The Keto Butai had 244 planes. The task force, 16 and 17, had 221 and Midway had 82. He said, well, we had a lot more planes. Yeah, but our planes weren't nearly the quality that they were, all right? Not even close. And so the Japanese, they had the better pilots and they had the better planes. Okay. So what happened was, after we found out, we knew that, the, that the, they were here, Midway was tipped off. They started preparing to launch every plane they had. And so at 0430, the Gumos sends 108 planes on its way. Well, they had over 200. Where's the other 100? Yamamoto had ordered the Gumo, much to his chagrin, to only use half his force. He said, that's all you should use. I want the other half to be on the carrier decks, fueled and loaded with torpedoes in case any American surface ships appear. Well, the Gumo thought this is crazy. Those ships are all in Pearl Harbor. No one knows where those ships, they're all back there. There's no ships out here. And I need all my planes, but he didn't. He did not buck the order, though. And so, 108 planes, and this is unbelievable. They spotted and took off with less than 10 minutes. They were they put 108 planes in the air in less than 10 minutes. The Japanese did. They were by far the best in the world at that time. And they consolidated and they made their way down to here to Midway. Meanwhile, Midway at 05:30 launches all their planes except their fighter planes, and they're going this direction. Okay. But it wasn't a coordinated thing. As they took off, they just started, whereas the Japanese consolidated. At 0620, the Japanese come within range of Midway, and Midway launches the 18 old antiquated Buffalo bombers, or the fighters, out to meet this incoming wave of Japanese hunter planes. They are wiped off. I mean, it's just like a cow wiping the flies off its back in the summertime. And they hit it. That, that flight is led by a major named Red Parks. They were brave. But they went out to take on the Japanese about 30 miles out from Midway, right out here. And every one of them, but two, were shot down and Red Parks was killed. Never even broke up the formation. The Japanese come in. Now, remember I told you Fushida had led that first attack at, at, at uh, Pearl Harbor. He was their best. But leading this command, this command was a lieutenant named Tomonaga. And you say, well, why would he be doing it? Now, this is another one of these little miracles. Tomonaga, or I mean, uh, Fushida came down with appendicitis two days prior to this attack and was in the sick bay. He would have led the attack. Now, this is me talking. This is not in the records. But I think this is what that would have changed the battle. Because what happened is when Tomonaga, when they came on, on the Midway, their prime obje uh, objective was to take out the airfields. So the Americans couldn't launch an attack from there on the fleets or the, or the, uh, or the invasion fleet or the or the uh the time. Well, you're a young 20-year-old fighter pilot with a bomb under your wing, and you're pretty cocky. Do you want to drop that bomb on what an airfield, which would be like dropping it out in the field, or do you want to go blow that big hangar up? You see what I mean? And so what happens is that they destroyed all the above ground installations. They took out the hangars, they took out the, the bunkers, they took out the, the oil uh, facilities. But they only dropped a few bombs on the runway, the prime objective. My thinking is that had Fushida led that attack and not Tomonaga, he would have made sure there were certain people who were going to take out that airfield. It would have been the prime director, you see, and that didn't happen. So at 0700, now follow my timeline here because this is going to get kind of complex. At 0700, they left the island of Midway to return to the force. At, this is when 
He radioed back to, to, to Monaga, wrote it, radioed back and says, we have to have another strike. This place is not, it's not taken over. I mean, we're not put out of action. That airfield is still usable. So you're back here, Nagumo gets this word at 700, 7 o'clock in the morning. At the exact same time, he gets reports from these scout planes. He launched seven scout planes at the same time he, lost, he launched the uh, Tomanaga Strike Force. They were to patrol this area right here where, this, where I'm showing, just east of Midway Island. It took them about two and a half hours to get out there. They all got out there except one. Scout Plane 4 was a half hour late taken off because it had catapult problems. Another miracle. So at 7 o'clock, all these planes that he sent out here to patrol radio back and said, we've seen nothing, okay? So Nagumo's sitting there on the bridge. He says, there's nothing out here that I need to be worried about. We need another attack here. I've got all these planes on the hangar deck with, sitting there with torpedoes. They're doing nothing. He says, why don't we just rearm those, and by the time Tomonaga gets back here and we get him back on board, we'll have these rearmed with, with contact bombs. I'll send them back to Midway and we'll save almost three hours of time. And so he orders so. At about 7.02, he sends the order down to rearm all these planes in the hangar deck with contact bombs. So they start dropping off the torpedoes and putting on bombs. Well, at, uh, at about the same time, well, no, not about the same time, about 10 minutes later, at 7.10, the first strike is, comes in from Midway, all right? The first wave arrives, and there's, there are old torpedo bombers that come gliding in, and they are jumped on by the Zeros that are flying cover. They shoot down every one of them. One shoot, uh, launches its torpedo. It misses everything, all right? There's no hits, and they're all knocked out of the sky. So... But one thing did happen, and it's kind of significant. There was a, uh, a bomber, a B-26, flying cover over this for the Americans that was shot down. But instead of falling from the sky, it came right at Nagumo's flagship. I mean, it was just like a suicide thing right at him. And he's sitting there watching this come right at him. It came from 16,000 feet. And until it just was just on him, it thought it was going to smash right into the bridge. It missed the bridge by a matter of yards. I mean, the wind just nearly blew him down. It was that close. Now, depending on who you ask, Yamamoto, or I mean, Nagumo said that it was just because of the controls and stuff. America said it was the fighter pilot was just, you know, he was brave and making a last ditch effort. Take whatever you want. But it did almost hit the bridge, but it missed. But it unnerved Nagumo. Well, it unnerved everybody on that bridge because they all thought that the end was near. But that's all that happened out of the first wave. About Oh, a few about 20 minutes later, the second wave comes in, all right? Now we're, we're up to about, oh, 7.30. And they attack, and the same results. There are no hits. All of them are knocked out of the sky. They all crash into the ocean. They all die, and they, nothing is achieved, except, except the Japanese have to keep maneuvering their carriers. And what they would do, if a plane was coming in like this, and the Japanese uh, ship was like this, what it would do, it would turn and face it straight on. In other words, so it'd have a less, less angle to hit. And it didn't want it coming in at the broadside. So the Japanese were always moving their carriers around. Well, you cannot launch during an attack. That's the one thing you cannot do. So below deck, though, they are still just changing these bombs left and right. All right? Then, then it happens. At about 7.45, Around 30 to 40 minutes after he has ordered the rearming of the planes on the hangar deck, scout plane number four, the one that took off a half hour late, it radios in and this is what it said, 10 enemy ships sighted. Didn't say what kind, just 10 enemy ships sighted. I'd like to see Nagumo's face when that happened. All of a sudden, whoa, there's ships out there. They're not supposed to be any ships even within a thousand miles. And so Nagumo, whose first directive is to take care of any surface ships, says, well, Midway's got to wait. Call down there and start putting the, the torpedoes back on. So he calls down. They call down and said, hey, stop the rearmament with the bombs. Put the torpedoes back on. And so I mean, you can imagine these men on the, flat, uh, on the hangar decks. Well, they, they do. They start dropping the bombs back off they put on, and they roll them over here against the, just out of the way and start putting the torpedoes back on. Now this is a 7.45. At about eight o'clock, 
A group of B-17s come over from at about 20,000 feet and drop their bombs. And I've seen aerial photos of this. Well, from 20,000 feet, the Japanese would look up and see the bombs. They would just move the ships out of the way. And I've seen pictures of where these, ships, these bombs fall in their wake, just beside. But they, again, no hits. We've had three attacks on the Kido Butai and not a single hit. All right. A little bit later, about 10 minutes later, the last attack comes in. It's, uh, it, it's from uh, the Midway again, and the same thing happens. But just prior to that last attack, the American submarine, the USS Nautilus, shows up and basically in the middle of the Quito Bhutan. And it pops its periscope up and it sees all these carriers and it starts, goes to the battle station, it's gonna sink a carrier. But unfortunately for that submarine, the Japanese saw him. And so they send all these destroyers on the top of this of uh, the Nautilus, and they start dropping depth charts. Nautilus fired one torpedo. It went out the middle of nowhere. He didn't have time to aim it very good. It hit nothing, and he had to crash dive to save his crew and, and his boat. The last, uh, the last bunch from uh, Midway dropped their bombs, no hits. So we had four attacks from Midway. We had a we had a Japanese submarine, and we had nothing. In other words, we haven't had anything. We've lost all those planes and not, nothing to show for it. At about 8.20, Nagumo gets a, gets a confirmation that one of those ships that were out here, that the, out of that tent, was actually an aircraft carrier. What it turned out to be was Task Force 17, which is Fletcher's Task Force. And it was. Now there is another little miracle here I want to tell you about. This, this, this battle's full of miracles. Of all these scout planes that went out here, these seven scout planes, we know about number four being late. Number six, flew directly over Task Force 17. We didn't know that until after the war, when they read the accounts. But what Fletcher did, after he, he took his task force and he put it in a squall line, a little bit of overcast clouds and stuff. And by doing that, that pilot flew right over top of him, right over top of him, and didn't see him. Another one of those miracles. Because you realize what would happen. If he would have reported back, hey, there's a task force down here with a carrier, at seven o'clock was when he reported in, Hey, he had all those planes sitting on the hangar deck with torpedoes. He could have launched all of them, at least 100 of them, 100 planes taken on one ship. You know the outcome would have been of that, and the whole outcome of the Battle of Midway would have been altered. Another miracle at Midway. Okay. So that's where we're at. We have now had four attacks on, on the Gumo's Kari Butai. We've had a submarine send a, a torpedo at it, and we have nothing to show for it. But the Gumo's a little spooked. So he makes a mistake. He turns and he heads north, straight north. What he should have done. He should have turned, but he should have headed a little north west because the Japanese planes have greater distance on their travel than the Americans do. He could have taken, his, he could have taken them out of, out of harm's way. He didn't do that. All right, so he's turned north. All right, Nimitz, or I mean Nimitz, Fletcher, when he got to the court, let's go back. Now I'm going to jump back to what the Americans are thinking now, just so I can try to keep this so you don't get too confused. The Americans think, well, we've got two carriers out there. We need to attack that. So what Fletcher says, he tells, he tells Burns, you, you, fly, you send your planes out. I'll hold mine here in case the Japanese show up. All right? Just a precautionary thing. And so he does. And so at 0700, Task Force 16, which is the Enterprise and the Hornet, watch all their planes. The last ones to take off are the dive bombs. The first ones to take off are the torpedo planes. And they start towards where they heard last contact. But it, again, it's not a coordinated attack. When they take off, they, go, they just head that direction. So they're just spread out there just like this, flying towards them with no coordination whatsoever, no fighter cover. And so at the last one to take off was, is a is a Lieutenant Commander McCluskey. And he's on a dive bomber and he takes off at 7.54, almost an hour. It took the Japanese 10 minutes to launch 108 planes. It took us an hour to launch off two carriers. Uh, that's just how really ill-equipped we were at that stage of the game. All right. So they're on their way. They've turned north. And McCluskey is coming this way to, to look for the Japanese fleet. All right. Well. One other thing happened, and the historians call it the, the, the flight to nowhere from the Hornet. For whatever reason, 
the commander of the air crew that left off the Hornet, instead of flying to the southwest, where the Japanese are, he flies due west. It's the flight to nowhere. There is a, a lieutenant commander of, of uh, Torpedo Bomber 8 from the Hornet, keeps telling him, you're going the wrong way. He says, no, no, this is it. And, I, and to this day, we have no idea what he was thinking because he never survived, all right? But they start out and they're just flying, just totally off course to where the Japanese are. Well, about after about 30 minutes, the guy's name is Waldron. He says, you are going the wrong way. I'm breaking off. So he takes his squadron. Now you realize how much nerve this would do to break out of this and say, I'm going in my own direction. But he breaks out of that and heads towards where he knows the Japanese are. And it is Torpedo Squadron 8 of the Hornet. Right. It, it leaps. Now, at 9, this, at 9, 8.45, at 9, 10, New, the Gumo, that's when he turned the, the, the fleet north. All right. At about that time, you've got Tobinaga coming back from his bombing midway. They're really low on fuel. So this is known as Nagumo's Dilemma. It's not a dilemma to me, but this is what historians, uh, historians call it. Do you wait, and now you know these carriers are out here, do you wait, and you could by that time, you could have probably put at least 60 planes in the air with torpedoes on them to go attack those carriers that you know are out there. Or do you let Tomanaga's planes crash into the ocean because they don't have enough fuel? Well, that's called his dilemma. Well, it's not a dilemma. I can't see how any commander is going to let over 100 aircraft crash into the ocean, lose the pilots, lose the planes. I just don't think that had ever happened, and it didn't with him. So he takes Tominaga's planes back on while they're still rearming those ones below with the idea that they'll, as soon as Tominaga's planes are on, he's going to launch this attack. Well, then, again, one of those things, the uh, scout plane from the that, I talked about the one that came off the, the Hornet. It, it broke away. It shows up at about 10:10. Uh, 10, 10. It shows up right here, right out, right beside the fleet. But just like before, it's knocked down. Every every single pilot, every person on that flight was killed except one, and he was named. It was an ensign named George Gay. At the end of this, if I have any time left, I'm pushing time. I'll try to tell you what happened to George Gay. It's a pretty interesting story, but I don't have time to do it now. But George Gay is the only one that survived out of that squadron of, of torpedo planes from the Hornet. The rest of them were killed. Right. And so Fletcher, now it's about 8.30, he sat around her, uh, go back to time to 8.30, he hadn't seen any carriers, so he orders his planes off of the Task Force 17 to take off. And they do, just like they send the torpedo bombers out, but the only difference on this is Fletcher has some uh, support planes to go with those torpedo bombers, some fighters. And they happen to be accompanied by the best fighter pilot that the United States Navy had at this time, a guy named Jimmy Thatch. Anybody ever heard of the Thatch Weave? No? All right, the Thatch Weave was invented by Jimmy Thatch, and it is a combat maneuver in the air, and it's, it's highly effective, okay? And uh, I don't, again, I don't have time to explain the thatch weave to you, but thatch was accompanying these, these torpedo, or these, uh, yeah, these torpedo planes from Fletcher's. All right, McCluskey, who took off last off of the Enterprise, he shows up down here after they've turned to where the Japanese are supposed to be, and there's nothing there. I mean, it's nothing but ocean. And he's getting low on fuel. But McCluskey, now McCluskey's 40 years old. Almost all these other pilots are 21, 22, 23. McCluskey's 40 years old. McCluskey makes, as Nimitz says, one of the greatest command decisions ever made, and certainly the one best one made in, during the Battle of Midway. He tells his men, he says, look, we're going to stay out here. We're going to look a little bit longer. He says, we may crash in the ocean. I may be court-martialed, but we're going to look for these planes. And so what he does, and I don't, and I, to this day, I don't know why he didn't turn south. I have the natural tendency to be, Look, the Japanese are on a southward course, and you get there and they're not there, wouldn't you think they'd already gone south? I, I would have thought that, but he didn't. He said they'd been under attack. He thinks they would go away from Midway, which is what they did, and he would guess right. He said it was a gut feeling. That's all. It's just a gut feeling. So they start looking for the fleet, and in about 10 minutes, something caught McCluskey's eye. And what it was, it was a wake off of a ship that was reflecting off the clouds. 
And remember that torpedo, or I mean that submarine we talked about? Well, what happened was, was when the fleet turned north, N Nagumo left a, uh, a destroyer there to handle that submarine. He chased it for about 45 minutes, and then, you know, the fleet was long gone. He said, well, I'm leaving this, and I'm heading back to the fleet. So that destroyer <laughs> is going full bore as fast as it can back to the fleet, and it's turning up this big wake, and that's what McCl caught McCluskey's eye. So McCluskey turns towards it, he sees the destroyer. So he radios the rest of the, his, his formation, which consists of about 30 dive bombers. He says, follow me. And this is a gutsy thing, because they're not gonna have enough fuel to get back. So they head due north. At just the same time, about 1020, that Fletcher's dive bomb, or a torpedo plane show up with Jimmy Thatch, and they attack. Almost the same thing happens, except when the Japanese pounce on Thatch's, or on the, Fletcher's uh, torpedo bombers, Thatch starts shooting them down. The first time in the war this has ever happened, that they start losing, losing planes in, a, in a combat, air combat. He's using the Thatch weed. And so these buddies who are up here flying cover above the fleet, which is, uh, you know, the Kudo Butai, which is where they're supposed to be, they're supposed to, their number one priority is to guard those, those carriers. They look down there and they see their buddies being shot down. This is called target fixation. They see this and many, immediately they break off and they head down there. This is against everything they're supposed to do, but what a break for the United States. There is nobody flying cover above the Kido Bhutan. Nothing, there's nothing up there. And at just at this time, and we're talking now at 1010, McCluskey comes up from the south, Fletcher's dive bombers, show up and they show up at exactly the same time. The chances of this happen, this is another one of those miracles. It wasn't coordinated and they didn't even know each other was gonna be there, but here they are, boom, right at the same time. And so immediately they press the attack. There's no one to, to mess with them up there, the, the fighter covers over. And so what happens is, the, the uh, Enterprise's torpedo bombers, which consists of McCluskey, he dives on the Kaga. Remember that one of the Japanese, the Kaga. This was not the ship he should dive on. Military doctrine said that he should have taken the carrier that was the farthest away because he was the highest ranking commander. That was the way it was set up, which would have been the Akagi. But he didn't do that. Now, whether he was new to dive bombers where he didn't know that or the adrenaline got him, he forgot. But he dove as well as everybody else, all 30 dive bombers are diving on the Kaga. The other Fletcher's dive bombers, they're all diving on the Soru. 20, there was 22 of those. They're diving on that one. The Soru is hit first. It is hit a total of three times. It is set ablaze. The bombs that enter the flight deck, they hit those bombs. Remember all those bombs they took off laying around down there because they hadn't put them away? Massive explosions. It blows out the front and the aft elevator that act like chimneys. And it's just sucking the fire up through there. So within two minutes, the Soru is dead in the water, funeral pyre. McCluskey, or I mean, uh, yeah, McCluskey is diving on the Kaga, and here is the Akagi kind of getting away scot free. Well, here it comes again, one of these things, one of these great pilots we have. There was a guy named Lieutenant Dick Best. He's in an 85 degree dive at about 300 miles an hour going towards the Akagi when he sees what's happening. That the Akagi's getting away free over here, and we've got 30 planes attacking one, one carrier. He radios to his two wingmen, follow me. He breaks out of a 90 or 85 degree dive and heads towards the Akagi by himself, him and his two wingmen. There are no fighter cover, but the amount of anti-aircraft fire is unbelievable coming up out of that carriage. But they press the attack. McCluskey destroys the Akagi. One bomb goes straight through the, the tower, if you will, kills the captain, all the ranking officers, four others hit, it, it, one, of the, one of the few sailors that survived the cog, he said it was as if the sun had blown up in his face. Massive explosion. And then it's just fire leaping up out of the ship. Dead in the water, done. Best goes and attacks the Akagi. And when he does, he presses this attack. And as he oppresses it, all his fires come. He backs out of the flight, out of the dive, and lets his two wingmen go in first. One of them drops the bomb that lands on the port side close. The other one drops the bomb that lands on the starboard side, but neither one hit. He
he presses the attack to almost 1,200 feet. They're supposed to release between 2,000 and 1,500. 1,200 feet, he releases that bomb. And it's, it's questionable where he can pull out of that dot. All right? He does, and you could not have dropped that bomb in a more perfect spot. Right next to the tower, it lands, it goes through the flight deck, and it severs all the water lines. What are the chances of that? And he gets down at first, it starts fires down there, but quickly these fires start to build because they can't do anything about the water lines are broke. And then the explosions start from all the bombs that were down there in the flight hangar. And within about three minutes, it's done for. Them. So at 1021, on that morning of, of June the 4th, the Japanese are winning the war in the South Pacific. By 1027, the Americans have the offensive. We have sunk three of their frontline carriers, and we have gone from being defensive to we're on the offensive, and it happened within five minutes. It's the five greatest minutes of the history of the United States Navy. From 1022 to 1027, we sunk three frontline carriers. Everybody with me so far? Haven't yeah. lost you? All right. How am I doing all the time? I'm talking as fast as I can. I, I, did this, I did this in the mirror and it took an hour and 15 minutes. It didn't take seven hours. <laughs> hour and 15 minutes. So I told him I, I, I was still, I have 45. I said, okay. right. So now we got to get to the Japanese revenge. Now there's one carrier left, the Hiru. The Gumo transfers his flag off of the Akagi, because it's dead in the water, to a, to a nearby cruiser. And I mean, now they, their backs are up. Okay, they want revenge. The, Code of the, uh, of the Bushido, the warrior. And so what they do, they start, now here's, here's our task force. We've got two of them over here, 16 and 17. 17's up here, 16's down here, just to give you a reference point. They're a little bit separated, all right? 17's north of 16. What happens was that when they start at 11 o'clock, all the others were sunk, remember, around 1030. At 11 o'clock, the Hiru launches 18 planes, all right? And these 18 planes are to go find American carriers. And that's, I mean, that is their job, and that's what they're to do. The admiral in charge of the uh, Kiru is uh, Yamaguchi. He's a very, very aggressive uh, admiral. He should have been in Nagumo's place, to be honest with you. But he is a very aggressive and very, you know, kind of a warrior type uh, uh, commander. He sends these 18 planes out, and they head towards it. And now, here is one of the biggest mistakes the Japanese made in the whole time. Instead of, when the Japanese are here, instead of keeping distance between it, he orders that all the surface carriers close onto the fleet. They're trying to get into a surface battle with our American carriers. That'd be fine for all the surface vehicles except the Hiru, the one remaining carrier. They should have protected this ship at all costs. They should have gone the other direction. You could still watch those planes you had enough distance, but he closed. He got within about 72 miles, which was just ludicrous for doing that. That was a major mistake in the battle. But these 18 planes, they find, they find Fletcher's Task Force 17, and they oppress the attack. Out of 18, only seven get through. But these seven hit the carrier, or hit the carrier of Yorktown three times with, with bombs in the flight deck. The carrier erupts into flames and in the smoke, it goes dead in the water. They turn and head for home, looking back out over their shoulders, and here's a dead carrier sitting there, smoke bellowing out of the Yorktown. They roll it all back that they have destroyed this carrier. And so they make it back. The Kobayashi was the lieutenant that was in charge of that, that particular raid. All right. They get back. Well, up here, Task Force 16, they have no intention of getting into a surface bit of fight. Now, that ain't going to happen. So Spurance, he turns his fleet to the west to increase the distance, which was definitely what he should have done. But he can still launch. So what he does, he launches, or he waits to get out of distance while the Japanese are re recovering up here. Well, the Japanese land, and they've lost about 20% of their, they, they're, they're down to only just a handful of planes left. But they're hell bent on finding another carrier because now they think they've destroyed one, they have one carrier, Americans only have two left. So we can go out there and destroy another carrier, then it's one on one. And so we're salvaging something out of the battle. Now that, that's, that's their thinking here, okay? And so what happens next is that at about uh, 1331, 
Tolmanaga, remember him? Tolmanaga that led the first attack on Midway. He takes 10 torpedo bombers and he heads out off the Hiru, looking for the rest of the fleet. At 30 miles out, he spots a ship that's going at 19 knots, no fire, no smoke, has to be a different ship than what they attacked early. It's not. It's still the Yorktown. This is how good the American were at, at damage control. They put those fires out, the engineers refired those boilers. Within an hour, they had that ship underway, and from 30 miles out, you couldn't see any flight damage on the, or any damage done to the flight deck. All right? So Tomanaga thinks, wow, there's another carrier, I'm gonna attack it. He doesn't think that's a Yorktown, he thinks it's destroyed. This is a huge break for the United States, because the other two carriers are sitting up there unscathed. And so it does, he does, the Tomanaga. So what Tomanaga does, he splits his force. He brings one, he, he and three other planes come in from the north. He sends three other planes from the south onto the Fletcher's Yorktown. As Tomanaga comes in, he's knocked out of the sky by Fletcher. But his plane set on fire, and, but he is able to drop his bomb before he crashes into the sea and is killed. So Tomanaga dies in that attack as do the other three that are coming in from the north. But the three that broke off and swung around here to the south, come up to the other side, they, they kind of went un, unnoticed. And they fire three torpedoes at the, at the Enterprise. Two hit, and that's it, for, or not the Enterprise, the Yorktown, and that's it for the Yorktown. Its boilers are out, it's, to, go to that last. Its boilers are out, and this is what it looks like right here. Look at the list, it's got a list. And so Captain Buckmaster, who thinks it's gonna roll, he orders a bandit ship, because he, he, there's no salvaging it now, and it, it's done for. And so this plane, this poor ship has been hit at Coral Sea, and has hit in two separate attacks, and it's, it's still afloat, but if they think it's gonna roll, if they think it's gonna roll over. So at 1500 hours, it's abandoned, all right? Tomonaga's force comes back in 1545, what's left of it, and lands. The Japanese are now down to nine aircraft. That's all they have left, is nine total. And they're wore out, they're, they're spent. They've been all either flying cover, flying strike missions, dodging the attacks the whole day. And so they land, and so the captain, tell, or the admiral tells them, you go down, rest, get something to eat. We're gonna make one less attempt to sink a carrier. We're gonna do it at dusk. He sent, then finds out that the carrier they attacked the second time was again, was this one right here, it was Fletcher's Yorktown. This is devastating news, but you know, it is what it is. They're gonna still try to put out one more attack on the American fleet. In the meantime, Dick Best, remember the one that broke off? He's, he takes over command because uh, McCluskey's been wounded during the battle uh, when they sank the Kaga. Dick Best has about 20 planes and they're a collection of everything they've got from all the different carriers, and he sets out to find the Hiru. He comes on the Hiru at 1645. They spot him. At 1710, they attack, and within two to three minutes, they hit the Hiru four times, and one of the bombs comes directly from, from Dick Best. He's the only, one of the only fighter pilots ever in the history of the United States Navy to hit two aircraft carriers are two targets in the same day. He hit the Kagi and he hit the Hiru. The Hiru erupts in flames. It didn't have its bombs laying around, but it didn't matter with that many hits on it. it it's done for, okay? It doesn't sink right away, but it's no longer a viable, uh, a viable carrier. Yamamoto hears this. He first thinks he's gonna charge the island of Midway with his, with his support other others ships but then thinks better of it. Look, you can't put any more ships at, at, at risk. And this is late on the, really, really late on June the 4th. Early morning on June the 6th, two in the morning, he calls off the attack, all right? But one more thing happens, uh, or actually two more things. The Hiru, we sink, and his, this is the order. Fine here. No, so I, I mean, I've only done this battle about a thousand times, but I still got to have a cheat sheet. <laughs> yeah. The Japanese, at 10, 1925, the Kegas uh, sinks, 811 lives lost. At, uh, well, the other one's been before that. 
and Soaru at 1913 sinks with 711 lives lost. At the next morning, the Akaga sinks at about 4 o'clock in the morning with 260 lives lost. And then at 9.15 on the 5th, uh, the Hiru finally sinks after being torpedoed by another one of the destroyers of the American Peninsula. So all four of them have sunk now with a loss of lives. The Japanese lost four aircraft carriers, 250 planes, 121 airmen, and, and more important than this, which no one ever talks about, they lost all their skilled mechanics. And you think, what's the big deal with that? Some guy that, the Japanese aren't an industrial nation. These people have been trained in Nazi Germany and some in the United States. These are, these are aircraft engineers. These are, these are people that they cannot replace that takes care of these. Losing them was even more vital to them than losing those airmen, which most people never realized that. But they lost all of them. So they lost 3,000 men total. 3,000 sailors died in the Battle of Midway. Americans lost one carrier to Yorktown. They lost 144 planes, 362 men died, and basically Operation MI was a rousing success for the Americans. It was a disaster for the Japanese. And that's how, that's how the battle unfolded. And they call it the Miracle of Midway. There's a book written by Gordon Prang I recommend to you. It's, uh, the title is The Miracle of Midway. He goes into great detail about this, much more so than I can do up here. And uh, it was a turning point in the battle of the South Pacific. From that point on, we were on the attack. We were, on, we were the aggressors. On August 4th, we attacked Guadalcanal with the help of the carrier force. And, uh, and from then, it was a three-year three year period to, to win back the war. Thank you for your time.